So we're back with our 12th socially distant studio visit uh, for Hall Walls Contemporary Arts Center. And as I've said before, that's a bit of a misnomer. I casually call these the pandemic diaries because I've been checking in with uh, different visual artists we've shown over the years uh, in different parts of the country to see how they're doing, uh, what they're doing, what things are like on the ground where they are and uh, just how they're coping in these uh, weirdest of weird times. And today we're talking um, to Wayne Hodge, who is in New York City, and whose show Skin Like Distant Stars showed at Hall Walls in November, December of 2016. So Wayne, my first question appropriately with everyone is, how are you? Much better. Um, I actually contracted uh, COVID-19 in the middle of March and uh, in, uh, inadvertently passed it to my wife. Now, I never actually got a test. I was uh, sick for more than two weeks um, and she got sick and um, was uh, briefly hospitalized and had a, uh, had a test there, um, you know, at that Point. I know that the conversation about testing has really changed quite a bit um, since this thing first started. Um, the, you know, they just, um, and I think it's still kind of hard if you're not a, um, if you don't have an underlying health condition to um, get a, a test. Um, and I spoke to a couple of doctors and they sort of, um, said, oh, you just have the flu. <laughs> and um, this was obviously a lot, um, a lot more severe than uh, a flu. But um, we've been um, convalescing, obviously. Um, you know, it's, it's hard because um, we were both sick and we have a seven-year-old uh, with schools closing and uh, having to sort of do school from home. Um, uh, it's just uh, uh, there's a there's a lot of parts uh, a lot of moving parts to the day. Um, uh, one of my uh, things I like to say is, <laughs> you know, some people are saying it's like you know I'm I'm stuck at home I'm bored, but uh, we kind of haven't had a bored day yet, <laughs> so to speak, uh, as there's uh, sort of always something uh, going on. But uh, we're good, much better. Um, we're in good health and um, have recovered. So, can you um, you're the first person I've spoken to that has um, had the virus. Uh, can you just, without too many gory t details, but just can you distinguish it uh, compared to like a really bad flu? Like what, what were the, the, the symptoms that you experienced that really, uh, that you really took note of? Well, um, I had a, like, a, I had a fever for two weeks straight. Um, usually if I have a flu, you know, you have a fever for a couple of days, it breaks and you go on to, you know, and you go on to recover. Um, this just lingered for so long. And I know that the kind of quarantine, uh, protocol has been like sort of 14 days. And, you know, I guess you sort of have the expectation that that 14 days, you know, okay, I'm sick this week. I'm still sick this next week, but I'm going to get better soon. And the fever went away, you know, you know, aches, tiredness. Um, around the second week was when the cough came in, and that um, was really, uh, I mean, I actually didn't have too many respiratory issues. Um, I did have this, like, you know, a hacking cough for, um, you know, a little over a week, and, um, but it, uh, you know, it was able to kind of work out of my system fairly fast. I was on some um, medications as well, but um, it seems like, you know, kind of after that, that recovery period where you're supposed to be better, there's like a whole nother week where you just kind of, and I can't really describe it other than sort of feeling off. Um, and also in this time, you know, the whole like, I didn't sort of, wouldn't describe it as a loss of sense of taste. Um, for me, it was like, when you're sick and you eat food, it's kind of like it tastes bad. It was like that in, in that sense, like I remember one morning, like kind of pouring a, a, a small glass of orange juice and taking a sip and just realizing like I could not drink it. It was like my sweet and salty taste buds had been crosswired. It was really like, 
the orange juice was really, really, like orange juice is sweet anyway, but it was like really, really so sweet as to make me nauseous. And I found that with the, you know, certain savory things, um, you just like the, the savoriness like was so overwhelming. And um, so, you know, that kind of was coupled with that, you know, with, with all the other symptoms, it was a, it's a pretty miserable experience, I can say. Now, did your seven-year-old manage to evade all of this from you and your wife, like, and not, not catch anything? Absolutely. Yeah, um, you know, and we, um, you know, at one point, um, we sort of um, spoke to his grandparents and we were like, well, you know, they were sort of, they, they, they were like, well, maybe you can sit and stay with us for a couple of days. And we said, no, that's not a good idea because even though he wasn't showing any symptoms, um, we sort of assumed that he could be a carrier especially being around us and, you know, kind of being locked in the house. So um, he hasn't had any symptoms or, um, you know, exhibited anything, but, you know, we just sort of on the side of caution assumed that he, you know, you know could probably get someone sick if he were um, to be in close contact with them. So, you know, we try to social distance as best as we can in our tiny apartment. How are, how is social distancing in your neighborhood? Is it, um, uh, is it working well? I mean, do you go out at all? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. Um, gosh, you know, there are kind of places where it seems like it works well and places that it doesn't seem well, uh, doesn't seem to be working so well. No, for, um, for our part, when this kind of all started, uh, we weren't really like, you know, just, we couldn't get masks. So there was sort of a period where um, there was just, you know, there weren't any masks to be had. Um, and I was actually given a, uh, some surgical masks from um, my, the superintendent of my building actually um, gave me some uh, surgical masks for me and my family. And that kind of helped us to kind of um, be able to kind of make those trips to the grocery store and, you know, kind of get those essential things. The grocery store is a really tough situation because depending on the neighborhood and the grocery store that you're, that you go to, um, we have a little grocery store in our neighborhood that um, is really hard. It's so small. It's just impossible to sort of social distance. I mean, everyone wears a mask and, uh, you know, everybody sort of like gingerly steps around each other or walks down the other aisle if they can. But uh, at the, the point where they're just uh, like, you know, so many people in there, it's kind of impossible to do that. Um, I did um, go to another grocery store in another neighborhood, one that we usually frequent. Um, we actually, um, I went to um, the closest Trader Joe's and I went about a half an hour before they opened and it took me an hour to get into the store based on the lines and the social distancing. And it was like, a, the line was about um, wrapped around um, roughly three city blocks. So it's like, you know, <laughs> and, you know it kind of goes back to like the, uh, you know, I guess they used to sell these sort of anecdotal stories about the Soviet Union in the 1980s, how they would wait hours and hours in line just to get a McDonald's hamburger. And it's sort of like that's, that was sort of the situation just to get some, you know, toilet paper and uh, cat food. That, uh, that is very severe. I mean, uh, I can't claim anything like that is going on in Buffalo. I mean, I don't go to Wegmans anymore because I figure it'll be just, you know, ridiculous. So I go to another store, Tops, and even at the best of times, it's never crowded, so you know I go there now, and there's six people in the whole grocery store. Um, wow. So I mean, that's sort of the benefit of being in a less densely populated city, uh, sure. whereas you can't really avoid that. Um, what have you been uh, teaching? What have you been doing during this time? Um, I have been um, doing some um, art handling. I've been working for um, a company doing like art handling and condition reporting, uh, art transport. Um, but are you still doing that now? Well, no, we've been, um, they have uh, been closed, um, I guess, sort of off and on. Um, there were some really, I mean, some folks got laid off um, the, um, and they cut our payback. Um, so 
there's been like, I kind of went through the whole process of trying to get unemployment and dealing with the, you know, the telephone lines with the state and everything like that. That seems to be kind of um, become, you know, that's sort of worked itself out. Um, you know, last week I was able to get um, a payment. We'll see what happens this week. Um, I certified a claim, so, you know, I should, um, I should know soon. Um, but I mean, you know, like everyone else, I've been just kind of applying for emergency grants and, um, uh, you know, trying to uh, just figure out ways to uh, kind of, you know, keep some food in the fridge um, and keep the kid in pancakes <laughs> until this thing blows over. Um, you know, I will be fortunate in the sense that, you know, there will be work for me when things open back up again, but uh, some of my colleagues were uh, unfortunately not as fortunate um, in that regard. What, um, how has remote schooling been for your seven year old? Uh, <laughs> it's pretty, uh, it's pretty challenging because um, we, um, I think there's a couple of things you know, the school building, the act of kind of commuting to school every day sets up a certain expectation. There's a certain structure in the school day. And it's really tough to kind of, um, you know, replicate that, particularly when, um, you know, there are things that, you know, despite the fact that I know my, the, my work is closed, my job is closed, there's still, um, you know, meetings and conferences and there are certain things that like um we are required to do so we have to sort of like and, and of course my wife's schedule is incredibly busy as, as well so we have to kind of like you know schedule like who's going to use you know who's going to use laptop x uh, at certain times and, and and things like that and so we kind of you know the consequences being that like you know we don't necessarily start uh his school day in the in the morning we usually start around noon and um so you know kind of that afternoon by uh you know mid mid afternoon if it's a good day late afternoon if he's you know um really kind of struggling with uh getting getting the work done but um i mean we've had some really kind of fun moments too um we made a uh comic book yesterday we kind of last week we've been working on comic books and uh little uh you know i was uh, drawing some comic book characters for him and uh he seemed to think those were really cool and so he made his own comic book character and um wrote a, a little tiny book for uh, uh his his class so there are things like that that are really fun and you know things that are kind of you know we kind of uh pass the work off like what's whatever my strong suit is so i usually take care of like you know um art and uh you know we alternate on the reading and writing part um he's pretty um actually takes to the math very well and then uh you know kind of dividing the work between his uh enrichment classes so i usually get the art projects i've, I've kind of wondered about uh, artists with kids because um i've wondered I, obviously kids will miss being around their friends and that sort of daily socializing but uh at the same time i kind of think of kids at least of a certain age as um adaptable and able mm -hmm. to cope is that something you're finding well um you know we have had a um a few sort of virtual play dates with his friends from school um or we'll set up um like an iPad or a laptop in his room and uh, let them play and kind of talk and have that social interaction and uh we also like the parks have closed, but we kind of um, when we can take uh, take time to go out and um, sp spend about an hour just in a kind of park like area. So for us, like lately, it's been um, at um, we live about a block, a block and a half from Grant's tomb. <laughs> So it's totally like, you know, it's closed off and they've actually put barricades in front of the, the, the building itself. But the area that leads up to it is like sort of a line park area where, you, you know, you could ride a bike or, um, you know, run, uh, run around. We've done some sidewalk talk out there and things like that. So that's kind of what we used to kind of get that like, you know, uh, fresh air aspect. It's certainly not enough. And there are times when, uh, uh, there are times when he's jumping off the walls and there's kind of nothing we can do about it. So we kind of like, you know, we've instituted a rule where he's allowed to jump on the bed now. 
<laughs> just to kind of like you know um, get some 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 physical activity in and get a little bit of um, energy, um, get a little energy burned. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are just things that like you know they're adaptable, but you know we have to adapt as well. So. Um, my next question is kind of maybe going to be a weird question, and I will try to ask it as elegantly as I can, though I might fail at that um, because it's sort of a big fat kind of question. Um, I was thinking about your work leading up to our conversation and how, you know, in your work you source uh, media, you source history, uh, and you source science fiction uh, yeah. to deal with issues around uh, race, identity, desire. Uh, particularly in the science fiction vein uh, and having a familiarity with that genre and those symbols and metaphors. Um, is there anything about that that tells us something about what appears to be a dystopic moment that we are all sharing right now? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, right. This is like the, you know, uh, we are now in a dystopic moment, but we have sort of always been in a dystopic moment, right? Um, yeah, um, it's funny because um, I was just thinking about that because, um, you know, I've been working on that, uh, on this, you know, well, let me, let me back up. Um, so in terms of like, kind of like art making during this time, you know, it's really, you know, the big, things that the supply chain has been interrupted to kind of a major degree. So, um, you know, you could sort of like, you know, order things or like, you know, um, where you're usually, you're used to getting things from, you don't get them that way anymore. Or if you get them, there's such a delay that it's just, I have all this like time, but there's like, you know, what do I do with it? Um, so I had started this project where I've been working on this series of um, like uh, collages on panel. And I prepped the panels before the, um, but I didn't really have an idea of what I was gonna do. It was just sort of like, you know, I was gonna just make some new panels. So I prepped the panels, but I didn't have um, really, uh, like then COVID happened. And so I have these panels and I've been sort of looking at like, what do I do with them? And sort of as an exercise, I've been, I have a box of um, collage material, like, and it's kind of like off cuts, scraps, things that I like maybe like were using for a collage and I ended up not using. Um, and it's actually probably, this box has probably been around since around the time or kind of before skin like distant stars. So I've kind of been opening this box up and kind of going with these like, you know, and as an exercise sort of saying like, well, what can I make with what I have here in front of me? And so it's this kind of like economy of scarcity, which has in a way kind of always informed how I've made these things to a certain degree. But um, I think it's become more poignant now in um, terms of having to kind of um, scavenge and scrap and kind of try to make do with what materials you have and sort of see what kind of, um, what kind of interesting things you can come up with in that process. So, um, yeah, uh, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, as far as the, the larger question of uh, the pandemic and uh, what its implications for definitely um, in terms of race, um, I find it, you know, you know, when the data sort of came back that um, this was uh, hitting African American communities in this country particularly hard, not to mention the implications for um, the larger so called underdeveloped world, um, I think that, you know, it becomes a very pointed contrast to kind of at the, and you know, I don't, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist here, because uh, but the idea that like at the moment that that data was released, kind of around that same time, was when you started to see these um, protests of um, these kind of um, these protests of people sort of wanting to reopen the economy and um, and then they, you know, they sort of backdrop that, um, you know, this sort of pro-Trump 
uh, backdrop around them. And I think the New York Times has uh, already uh, sort of like made a point that these are sort of backed by the same uh, same players who backed the Tea Party movement a few years ago. So I think, you know, in that sense, like I said, you know, <laughs> We are now in a dystopic moment, but we have always been in this dystopic moment. It's just sort of how the 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 um, the powers that are um, looking at ways to profit off of um, off of the suffering and misery of of other folks, and you know, uh, in a way that um, you know discounts. Um, the real human cost of that. So I think definitely I'm thinking about that in terms of uh, the work. Um, I've been thinking a lot also about the, you know, with the Android Negroid series, this idea of like, the, uh, of, of the portrait and the masking and how that um, applies now with, uh, you know, the social distancing measures and this masking in public and this idea of like you, um, you know, <laughs> it changes the way that the, the way that we interact has changed so much that, you know, if you, it's like, if you see someone with a mask, you, um, I mean, we were just avoiding each other anyway, but there's this kind of way that this, uh, suspicion of, of an other body has, uh, informs how, how, how we move throughout, you know, our daily lives now that, um, I'm hoping that, you know, that I'm, I'm just sort of processing those things right now. So. Yeah, I was thinking recently, I have a couple masks that a friend made. They're really great. I find them really weird to wear. They look nice enough. But I w it occurred to me the other day uh, as I was going to the grocery store that it used to be uh, not that long ago that a dollar store, you know, you couldn't go in wearing your hoodie up. That's right. And yeah. now everybody's got to be masked. Yeah. So, uh, you know, just one of many ironies, as you say, uh, or suggest that the, maybe the pandemic has re just revealed the dystopia we were always, always <laughs> in. Yeah. Um, as I said to someone else too, I, I, and I don't mean to trivialize anything, but uh, I was talking to John Jennings, uh, who, who you know, and whose work is heavily invested in Afrofuturism. And I said like, isn't this a moment where we wish Wakanda were a real place so we could have some <laughs> technology out of there to, to solve, solve this scenario? Hey, well, I mean, that's, I think, you know, of course in that is like, you know, we are the technology, right? <laughs> and it's about how, how, you know, how we apply that technology is really the measure of how we, uh, how we weather something like this. Um, and, and that is something that, you know, that the, the jury's still out on that, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, I'm an optimist and I, I do think some version of normal will return and I don't know what it's gonna look like or when it's gonna happen, but uh, I have to be an optimist because I work at a program-based organization where sure. we <laughs> yeah. rely on people to come out to things and be, uh, congenial and uh, and friendly with each other and enjoy programs. Um, so let me ask you as a last question, um, when whatever version of normal does return, uh, what's the first thing, large or small, could be minor, could be major, what's the first thing that you feel like you want to do? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I think, um, I mean, for me, I think it's just like, I, I'd like to walk around without a mask on. And I don't think that's gonna happen when normal comes back. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, some of the, you know, at least, you know, from, you know, the environment of my day job and things like that, it seems like this is gonna be a, like the whole, you know, the wearing of PPE is going to be kind of a ongoing thing. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's really sort of looking forward to, um, we like to go to uh, the Adirondacks and vacation. And I don't think that's gonna happen this summer. Um, we still kind of have our fingers crossed, but um, that was something that sort of, you know, I was really looking forward to. And so now it's like, 
thinking about those things that you want to do and how you can sort of get some sort of um, suitable substitute for that with um, what we have, uh, you know, what we're going to be able to do. Because the idea that it sort of, you know, is going to open up like sort of one day be not open up and then be open is like, it's gonna be this sort of gradual step up. So I think it's kind of impossible to sort of say that there's like one thing. It's like, a, at this level, I'm gonna do this thing. And at this level, I'm gonna do this thing. And at this level, I'm gonna do this thing. So, you know, that's, uh, yeah. As we all will. Um, Wayne, thank you so much for taking some time to talk today. Um, I'm really glad to see you and glad to see you upright. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And, um, you know, I hope that not too much time goes by where we see each other in uh, real time in person again. Absolutely. Thank you so much, John. Thanks. Bye-bye.